Hello and welcome. In this, our inaugural lecture, I'd like to try to accomplish three things. First, I want to sketch the purpose of our 36 lecture course on the philosophy of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. Second, I want to try to give you a sense of the, the terrain that we're going to cover, and the path we'll follow through that terrain. In other words, what the principal segments of our course will look like. Then third, and finally, I'd like to make some preliminary remarks about why the legacy bequeathed to us by Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle may be one from which we can still learn more than two millennia later. Now, our task will be to explore the groundbreaking thought of three of the greatest thinkers in the Western tradition, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. The overarching thesis of this course, simply put, is this. Socrates was responsible for a fundamentally new way of philosophizing, of trying to grasp the world by means of human reason. And, for all their great genius and indeed their originality, Plato and Aristotle were deeply indebted to Socrates. Now, the mere mention of these three names may well be enough to, to call to mind the, the spirit or, if you like, the very essence of philosophizing. The love of wisdom, after all, which is the literal meaning of the Greek word philosophia. We're going to try to do our best to understand the questions that they thought were the fundamental ones, and to begin to see the answers to those questions that they thought were the most impressive or persuasive. Together, then, we're going to try to see the world through their eyes. Now, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle are of course, linked by the, the common name philosopher that history has, has bestowed on them. They also share an historical epoch. The period of concern to us begins in 469 BC with the birth of Socrates, and it ends around 322 BC, which is the approximate year of Aristotle's death. But they also share a more intriguing bond, Socrates. Because Socrates was the teacher of Plato, and Plato, in turn, became the teacher of Aristotle. So taken together, then, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle constitute one of the most remarkable flowerings of the human mind that the world has probably ever known. And this course is going to investigate their attempts to grasp the world as it is in truth, or according to nature, or by necessity. These are all ways of describing the, the heart of the philosophical activity. Now, I should note that this course doesn't presuppose any prior knowledge of or even exposure to our three thinkers. But I do hope that it will be of interest to, to those who have encountered these thinkers before. After all, the, the well that we'll be tapping here is a very broad and, and deep one, and I think we can only profit by returning to it again and again. Well, with that said, I, I have to admit that spending time with Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle can be a pretty humbling experience. And I'd be the first to say that it isn't always pleasant to be humbled. To be in the presence of such seriousness of purpose, such sustained intellectual intensity, such remarkable penetration, well, it's, it's likely to make manifest our own limitations in these regards. But, as I hope you will come to agree, spending time with, with Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle can also be inspiring and even exhilarating. As a result of their remarkable generosity or humanity, these great thinkers were concerned not only to possess for themselves the, the correct grasp of the world as it is in truth, they were concerned also to help those of us who are really just beginners make some such progress in that same effort as we're capable of. Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle were also teachers, in other words. And the works we will study are intended, after all, not for the masters, but for students, for us. So together, then, we're going to set out to discover the character of the new Socratic philosophizing. What was new or, or different or strange about his way of thinking? What especially marks his thought off from, 
from all those before him, whom we now refer to collectively, of course, as the pre-Socratics. We're going to consider the motives that Socrates had for making a, a fresh start, if you like. What problem or difficulty had, had stymied the earlier thinkers, according to him? And what permitted Socrates to think, as he evidently did think, that he had made more progress than they? And we'll look at the ways in which Socrates' two greatest heirs, Plato and Aristotle, adopted, but also adapted or, or altered, the Socratic way of philosophizing. Well, this much then is a very general statement of the purpose of our course. Let me turn now to my second task today, and that is to sketch the major sections of our course. We're going to proceed chronologically, beginning, of course, with Socrates of Athens, who was born, as I noted, in 469 BC, and he died in 399. And yet to say that Socrates died in 399, that, that's certainly true, but it's not exhaustive or even very revealing. It's rather saying, like saying that the Titanic was a ship. At the age of 70, Socrates the philosopher was charged, tried, convicted, and executed by the democracy in Athens. What was, I hasten to add, no provincial backwater, but the freest, the most cosmopolitan city in Greece. So in trying to grapple with the meaning of, of Socrates then, at some point we have to try to understand not only his life, but, but also his death, the, the sad and, and maybe the tragic nature of his death. Or better put, we have to understand the possible connection between his life and his death. What was it about his life and his activities that so provoked the anger of his fellow citizens? It is, I suspect, Socrates' manner of dying, recorded unforgettably by Plato, that's mostly responsible for the, the admiration that Socrates enjoys centuries later. I suppose he has to be the, the single most famous philosopher of all time. And if you took a, a random sample of Americans and said, name a philosopher, Socrates would probably top that list. There seems to be something noble and maybe even heroic about him since he chose to die rather than give up his search for the truth. But Socrates is also an enigmatic fellow, it turns out. There seems to be at his core something mysterious about the man. Now one reason that Socrates is so hard to pin down is this strange fact. Socrates never wrote a single word. We don't have so much as one line from his own hand. And this isn't because his writings were lost in the course of history. No, it's clear that he chose not to write. Now later on, we'll have occasion to reflect a bit more on this strange fact. But for now, I stress just one thing. Because Socrates declined to write, we who want to learn about him, about the man and above all about his thought, we're forced in the first place to turn to those of his contemporaries who both, who both knew the man and were willing to write about him. There are only three such people, it turns out. First, there's the greatest comic playwright of antiquity, maybe of all time, Aristophanes, whose approximate dates are 457 to 385 BC. Second, there's Xenophon of Athens, 428 to about 354 BC. And Xenophon was a student of Socrates, as well as a thinker in his own right and a a great military commander. And then finally, of course, there is Plato. And I'll speak about Plato in just a minute. Aristotle, by the way, didn't know Socrates directly, since Aristotle came to Athens only after Socrates had died. We're going to begin our examination of Socrates by discussing the portraits of him left us by both Aristophanes and Xenophon. Now, 11 of Aristophanes' plays have survived down to the present day, and one of these eleven, a play called The Clouds, has as a central character none other than our man Socrates. In fact, Aristophanes' Clouds is the earliest document that we possess concerning Socrates. We know that this play was first produced at the city Dionysia, which was an important Athenian festival and theatrical competition 
in honor of the god Dionysius. And this was in the year 423 BC. Socrates then would have been about 46 or so, not young, I suppose, but then again, he lived to be 70. Now, as I hope you will come to agree, Aristophanes' Clouds is a great deal of fun to read. Not only is it a hilarious, in parts outrageous, send-up of Socrates, it also contains, I'll argue, a very thoughtful and even serious critique of Socrates. The Clouds is an important document, in part because it portrays, in the element of comedy, of course, Socrates' characteristic activity, or maybe put it a little more precisely, it portrays how his characteristic activity appeared to his fellow citizens, to the average Athenian. And we're going to devote two lectures to Aristophanes' Clouds. We'll turn from Aristophanes' funny and revealing portrait of Socrates, which, as I've said, includes a critique of him, to Xenophon's defense of Socrates, a defense that has its own brand of humor, actually, including the delights of a kind of gentle irony. Now, Xenophon was a remarkable man. He combined the life of the mind with the life of action to an extraordinary degree. For example, he was, of course, an avid student and an admirer of Socrates, and he wrote many works of great range and, and literary merit. I might note, just in passing, that Xenophon's Greek is, is so clear and correct and beautiful that down through the centuries, students learning ancient Greek have sort of cut their teeth on, on one or more of his, of his texts. But Xenophon also had a remarkable military career in which he single-handedly rescued some 10,000 of his fellow Greeks from what was an all but certain death in the heart of Asia Minor. And he tells us this himself, by the way, in a writing of his entitled The Anabasis of Cyrus, or as it's sometimes called in English, The March Upcountry. It's one of the world's great adventure stories that I, I recommend to you wholeheartedly. We, though, we're going to discuss the four writings of Xenophon that are devoted to memorializing Socrates. And these are, by name, the Memorabilia, something called the Oikonomicus, the Apology of Socrates to the Jury, and then the Symposium. Now, Xenophon's first and really most important purpose in each of these four writings is, of course, to defend Socrates, not least, as we'll see, against the, the criticisms leveled by Aristophanes. And like a good defense attorney, Xenophon is able to, to marshal evidence in a way that's most favorable to his client. But I'll argue that Xenophon is interested not only in defending or praising Socrates. He's also interested in helping those of us who want to understand Socrates to do so. And Xenophon's four Socratic writings are really an invaluable resource, I think, in getting to know this strange fellow named Socrates. And we're going to spend two lectures on Xenophon's presentation of Socrates. We'll turn next to Plato of Athens, the only other of Socrates' contemporaries who wrote about him and whose writings survive. Now, like Xenophon, Plato was a student and admirer of Socrates. But unlike Xenophon, all of Plato's works are devoted, directly or maybe indirectly, to presenting the philosophic life. There isn't a counterpart in, in Plato's writings to the Anabasis, say, which is a thoroughly political work. And while Xenophon speaks to us directly, many times in his Socratic writings, and even tells us of conversations that he himself had with Socrates. Plato appears only once in the 35 dialogues left to us by antiquity as his. Plato appears as one among many in the audience at Socrates' trial. Plato does not record a single conversation between himself and Socrates, though who knows, they must have had hundreds, thousands of such conversations. And in fact, Plato never once speaks anywhere in the dialogues. Now, Plato's reticence here seems to suggest this. In order to understand the, the teaching or the philosophy of Plato, we have to understand Socrates. At any rate, Plato always shines the spotlight on his teacher, Socrates, never on himself. Now, one sign of the importance of Plato in himself and as a source for our knowledge of Socrates, is that we're going to devote 
a total of 19 lectures to him, and we'll discuss a dozen of his dialogues. We're going to focus especially on how Plato presents Socrates as a teacher. How did Socrates approach his potential students, which is, after all, in a sense, what we are? What question or questions did Socrates think were most important for them to understand? So, guided by Plato, we're going to examine first Socrates' attempt to educate a fellow named Alcibiades, one of the most amazing, gifted, and controversial figures in all of antiquity. And we'll examine specific questions that typically take the famous Socratic form of what is, what is justice, what is virtue, and so on. We'll look also at the way that Socrates dealt with his chief rivals as a teacher, the sophists on the one hand and the rhetoricians on the other. Our study of Plato will conclude with his dramatic and, and deeply moving portrait of the climax of Socrates' life, which is, of course, his trial and execution. In the third and the final part of our course, we'll devote 11 lectures to Aristotle. Now, Aristotle, as it happens, is the only non-Athenian that we're going to meet. He was born in the city of Stagira, in northern Greece, in about 384, and as I've said, he died in about 322. But as a young man, Aristotle made his way to Athens, what the great Athenian statesman Pericles once referred to as the school of Greece. Athens was the center of learning in the Greek world. And Aristotle spent some 20 or so years under the tutelage of Plato, until Plato died in about 347. Now, not all of Aristotle's writings have survived, unfortunately. But if we take a kind of bird's eye view of those that have survived, it suggests that Aristotle's concerns were, in a way, quite different from the concerns of Socrates and Plato. What do I have in mind? I have in mind the, the much greater attention that Aristotle pays to natural science. Just consider the following titles, on the motions of animals, on the parts of animals, on plants, physics. There's nothing comparable to these in the dialogues of Plato. And this is true, I think, even of the metaphysics, which is Aristotle's sustained inquiry into the nature of existence or of being. Because although Plato too treats this subject of existence, just think of the most famous doctrine of the, the Platonic ideas or forms which he presents as the highest beings, Plato never does so without also addressing some important moral or political question. The most obvious example of this is that one of the lengthiest treatments of the Platonic ideas is found in a dialogue that we'll look at called The Republic. And The Republic has as its explicit theme, justice. For some reason, Aristotle was apparently more willing to treat this very lofty theme of being or existence on its own, or divorced, so it would seem, from our more immediate human concerns? Well, this is a long and a difficult question, but let me just say for now that, despite initial appearances to the contrary, I think Aristotle too shared the view that the proper path to philosophy had to include a comprehensive reflection on our moral and political concerns. And in order to show the, the continuity of concerns, between Aristotle and his teacher Plato, and his teacher's teacher, Socrates, we're going to discuss not the, the metaphysics or the motions of animals, but the Nicomachean ethics and the politics. These are the two principal works that constitute what Aristotle calls the philosophy of human affairs. Now, each of these books is fascinating in its own right. Among the most searching questions explored by the ethics is how our strong desire to be happy or, or to possess the greatest good for ourselves coexists with our equally strong desire to do the right thing, as we say, or in Aristotle's phrase, to act nobly, whether or not that makes us happy. And key to this inquiry is Aristotle's riveting portrait of the most excellent characteristics for any human being to possess, what he calls famously the virtues, both moral and, and intellectual. It's the virtues that promise us a life that is at once happy and admirable. And in the politics, which Aristotle explicitly presents as the sequel to the ethics, 
He acknowledges the, the great importance of the political community to our moral education. And then he proceeds to, to analyze what he calls the best regime, as well as the various other lesser kinds of regimes or, or forms of government. The best regime or best government is in a way that the capstone of Aristotle's philosophy of, of human affairs, and it provides, as we'll see, a, a fascinating point of comparison with our own democracy. Well, this then is a kind of quick summary of the sections of the course that lie ahead of us. Now, by way of a conclusion, I want to raise a more general question that is really, I think, fundamental to our whole enterprise here. To be blunt, why should we, we citizens of a thriving liberal democracy in the 21st century, why should we be seriously concerned with the thought of three people who lived so long ago, roughly 2,500 years ago? After all, so much has changed since then. Socrates didn't know of electricity, let alone the meaning of the word iPod. Plato was unaware of Judaism and Christianity and Islam. Aristotle, for his part, would have been puzzled by statements like, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. In matters of science or technology, in religion or faith, in morals and politics, haven't we progressed so far beyond these thinkers as to render them, well, superfluous? Again, to be blunt, haven't Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle become relics, relics of a benighted time? Well, it seems to me that there are two somewhat different sorts of answers that we could give to this perfectly reasonable challenge. First, I think it's impossible for us to know fully who we are, here and now, without knowing something, at least, of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. Why? Because these three thinkers were responsible for shaping, in fundamental ways, the foundation of what we now call the West. Aristotle, it's been said, taught the West the art of logic. Plato is an acknowledged literary master. Maybe he's been equal, but I don't think he's ever been surpassed. And Socrates, Socrates embodies the ceaseless quest for human knowledge, a quest that is part of the bedrock of the West. Together, in fact, these three thinkers help set before us the idea that the fulfillment of human nature must include the perfection of human reason. And that the perfection of human reason, of the human intellect, is both good and possible. This idea has certainly undergone many, many changes. But at its core, I think it could be traced back to Socrates and his heirs. What's modern science, after all, but a new attempt to fulfill the Socratic quest to get to the bottom of things, to, to understand by means of human reason or the, the human mind the world as it is in truth. The desire to know who we are and how we got here then, together with maybe simple gratitude, suggests that we would do well to learn about Socrates and Plato and Aristotle. There is, though, I think, another reason to study these thinkers. And in the end, I want to suggest it's the deeper reason. Simply put, it's still possible in our time not only to learn about Socrates and his heirs, but also from them. For all of our very real progress, have we in fact settled, once and for all, the fundamental questions or problems that we face as human beings? I would say that there seem to be some lingering doubts on that score, and, and rightly so. Take, for example, what's probably the greatest intellectual success of modern times, our natural science, which I just mentioned a minute ago. Many thoughtful observers have been wondering for at least a century, whether all the changes made possible by modern science, all of the, the technology that continues to, to shape our lives every day, whether these things are simply unqualifiedly good. Think, if you like, of the, the controversies right now surrounding the environment and global warming, stem cell research, the pervasive use of, of elect electronic devices that never let us really leave the office, and so on. But more than that, 
The search for human meaning or purpose or significance gives, I think, every sign of still being a reasonable, even a necessary search. In other words, it remains a necessary task for each of us at some point in our lives to raise the com comprehensive human question, how ought I to live? And if this is true, if it's true that this question retains its meaning for us, then there is every reason to turn for help in our own search or quest to those thinkers who've been recognized by our forebears as being worthy of serious consideration. Now, having said that, I don't mean to dismiss for a minute the, the very real historical, cultural differences between us and Socrates and Plato and Aristotle. I mean to suggest only that those differences, in the end, are not a decisive obstacle to our learning from them. Again, insofar as they share our common humanity, insofar as they sought to understand that humanity and what it means, we may well learn something of real importance from our study of them. It's even possible that they saw some fundamental things more clearly than we now do, distracted as we, we tend to be by the, the pace of modern life and its accompanying technological devices. Well, let me just summarize. We're going to devote the next 35 lectures to exploring aspects of the thought of Socrates, of his student Plato, and then of his student Aristotle. My thesis is that Socrates was responsible for a fundamentally new way of philosophizing or of thinking about the world, and that Plato and Aristotle, though absolutely independent thinkers in their own right, were nonetheless deeply indebted to him. We're going to look first at the only contemporary sources for our knowledge of Socrates, and that is Aristophanes' Clouds, and then the four Socratic writings of Xenophon, and then we'll turn to Plato, and finally to Aristotle. We'll encounter a, a rather fascinating cast of characters along the way, characters whom Socrates will, will put to the test, among them political traitors, charlatan teachers, uh, advocates of tyranny, and so on. And along the way, I think we too will be forced to, to test ourselves in interesting and, and I hope, profitable ways. So together then, we're going to try to bring to life aspects of the thought of Socrates and his greatest heirs, Plato and Aristotle. And I very much look forward to our shared study. Thank you.